Okay. I don't know what happened there. All right. Here we are, Wednesday night. Hmm. Anybody out there? Should we call this TV land or streaming land? Or one of the two? I'm not sure. Well, we're here tonight to uh, have another Bible study in the book of Jeremiah. If you're willing, uh, get your Bibles ready and we'll begin to... Uh, Open the Word of God together and allow it to once again uh, teach us, speak to us, challenge us, and change us. I uh, hope that all is well with you. Uh, if it's not, that you are continually before the throne of God, helping and asking Him to bring a solution to, to your situation. And I know that uh, when He is involved in your situations, uh, not only will his will be done, but you'll be satisfied and you'll have peace in whatever uh, is coming your way. I know that uh, there are still many needs in our church family to pray for. Uh, to list them is a very long list, uh, but I'll, I'll throw some out there at you. Bobby Johnson needs to be at the top of your prayer list. Calvin Draper, Wayman Patterson, John Pete, Shirley Ardlin, Shirley Bell, uh, to mention just a few. Uh, there are others who have uh, had uh, issues come up, and we just need to continue to lift up our entire church body uh, to give our bodies uh, strength and endurance and healing and health uh, because that's uh, that's the good good thing about what God does. He he brings and satisfies our needs and our desires. I know that uh, the week we're in the middle of it, and I hope that your week has become good uh, because uh, God is good in your life. You need to continually remind yourself. I hope your daily devotions, uh, time with Him, are going well to read a little bit of his word, to meditate upon his word daily, allow that word to feed your soul and to give you the encouragement that you need. Uh, oftentimes we forget that uh, it is the word of God that lifts us up through a time when our faith is being tested. So uh, let's just begin tonight and uh, realize that he is our source of strength, our source of hope, our source of peace, and our source of life. For he is the sustainer, and he is the one who gives and forgives. And we are so thankful that Jesus Christ is our peace, is our hope. And the love of God has been demonstrated in him to our hearts. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for the needs of in our church family. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you would be with uh, uh, Sandra Smith tonight, that you would be with uh, Sandy Watson and Calvin Draper, Father, with Bobby Johnson and Angela, with Wayman Patterson. Lord, that you would sustain and help Shirley Bell, give her father more good days as she's been having lately. We pray, Lord, that uh, as, as you continue to minister to these that we love we know that you will bring about your will through their lives and help us know and see the victories that will be won we give you glory and praise father way before it's time to see anything happen because we know that's the kind of god that you are we place our hope and trust in you and we know that you will bring about good things in our lives we pray for olive place lord we pray that you would increase our number lord we pray for those of our church family who, who are dedicated and, and love you, Father, would also dedicate themselves to the support of this church. 
we've been uh, hit on hard times, and Lord, we really need the, the fellowship to uh, realize that uh, the doors won't stay open if we won't open up our pocketbooks. And so, Lord, I just ask that you would challenge each and every one of us to, to give and to give generously. I thank you, Lord, for last week and the Gideons where we gave over $450 to, to uh, help uh, buy Bibles, to allow them to be placed uh, in various uh, hotels and hospitals uh, in our city. And so we thank you for that generous giving as well. Lord, tonight we ask that you would be generous in giving your wisdom and insight to us as we study your word. And we pray, Lord, that your word which never returns void, Lord, would fill the void that we have right now in our lives, those, those gaps of, of trust and faith that, Lord, we're lacking. And let us, Father, develop an attitude that your word will get us through even the most difficult circumstances of life. We pray all this in our wonderful Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Well, I see a few of you have clicked on. Uh, we got about seven people watching us right now, and I uh, hope that uh, this is going to be good. Jeremiah, that's where you need to have your Bibles open, and uh, we're going to look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 43 uh, tonight. Begin, I think, uh, chapter 43, excuse me, and 44, hopefully we'll get to 45. It's a short chapter but it, there's a lot of uh, import for you and I in that. So if you haven't noticed, we're quickly coming to the end of the book. And as we do, uh, we find ourselves seeing uh, Jeremiah here in chapter 43 being taken to Egypt, of which he has already prophesied, has preached, has encouraged the children of Judah not to go there. And uh, he was outnumbered. Now remember that he had the option to go back to Babylon or to stay with the people. And he chose to stay with the people. And so the outcome of that is basically the people really didn't have a lot of use for him. And so they took him into, into Egypt with them. Uh, let's move, if you have your Bibles, we're going to start with verse 19 to kind of give a context of what we're going to be talking about going forward in verse 19 of chapter 42, we were left with these words. Listen, you remnant of Judah. Okay, remnant. Key word for us going forward. This remnant of Judah. Remember, Babylon takes over, destroys the city, just as God had said it was going to happen because God mandated it to happen through Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Those who were left under Zedekiah, they, they were the remnant, so a small portion of a larger body, just a remnant, just like I think late you can have, a, they, call it, they used to have remnant sales, and that was with cloth and fabrics and things like that, uh, carpets, uh, there would just be uh, bits and pieces, a small remainder of the larger roll would be uh, a remnant, and so this is the l smaller sect, of the Jewish people left in Jerusalem who stayed. And now it says, the Lord has told you, do not go to Egypt. Don't forget this warning that I've given you today. For you were deceitful when you sent me to pray for the Lord your God by saying, just tell us what the Lord our God wants us to do. And today I told you exactly what he said, but you would not obey the Lord your God uh, so, all of that said is that they go to Egypt despite everything that had been set up there. And so let's start with verse 1 of chapter 43. It says, When Jeremiah had finished giving this message from the Lord their God to the people, Azariah, son of Hoshaniah, and Johanna, son of Kareah, and all of the other proud men said to Jeremiah, You lie, you liar. The Lord our God hasn't forbidden us to go to Egypt. Barak, son of Neriah, has convinced you to say this. 
So we will stay here and be killed by the Babylonians or be carried off into exile. So the, <clears throat> the point that, that's being made here is that there's this arrogance, this arrogance of God's people basically saying we can do what we want to do. After all, we're, we're going to do it because we're God's people. God isn't forbidding us. You're a liar. And, and your secretary, the, one, the closest guy to you who, who's writing down dictation for everything that you say, he's, he's, he's helping you spread these lies. You're a liar. Verse 4, so Joanna and all of the army officers and all the people refused to obey the Lord's command to stay in Judah. Johanna and his officers took with, took with them all the people who had returned from the nearby countries to which they had fled. In a crowd, there were men, women, children, king's daughters, and all of those from whom Nebuchadnezzar, the captain from the guard, had left with Gedaliah. Also including were the prophet Jeremiah and Barak. The people refused to obey the Lord and went to Egypt, going as far as the city of Tamphanes. So, the children of Israel, Judah specifically, God's chosen people, this remnant, they're basically saying, God was wrong and we're right. Now you would think, that kind of arrogance would just reside here on these pages. But we see it today. There are many people who simply because they believe they're Christians live and act in arrogant ways. There's not a lot of humility. They're showing us also here in this text that God's people were walking by sight not by faith. What do I mean by that? Well, they, we'll explain it even deeper as, as we get into these other chapters, but the essence of their life was the fact that they weren't going to remain in Jerusalem and just be annihilated. They were going to go to a place that they felt like, because after all, the Pharaoh had attempted, though he, he, he retreated, to come rescue them, to defend uh, Jerusalem. And that should have been their first clue because he retreated. They wouldn't face the Babylonian army. So they're going go to go there and put their lives at the mercy of the Pharaoh. And obviously, they haven't learned from their history, from their past. Uh, they've discounted their past. And they're just focusing on the now. And God said, don't go. Gave them a warning, don't go. But they went anyway. To repeat verse 7, the people refused to obey the Lord. That still goes on today. God's people still refuse to obey Him. And they go on and do what they want to do. We're right, God's wrong. So they went into Egypt, to the city of Thaphanes. Uh, and there, there was another warning. Then at Thaphanes, the Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, While the people of Judah are watching, bury large rocks between the pavement stones at the entrance of Pharaoh's palace, there at Tephaphanes, then say to the people of Judah, The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, I will surely bring my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, here to Egypt. I notice that God calls him his servant. Now, we, we touched on this early in the introduction of what's going on with this overtaking of the children of Israel, Ju Israel and Judah, northern tribe, southern tribe, 
and all going to be led back into captivity in Babylon. God's purpose in this is planned out because of their sin and their rebellion and their not living towards his word. So now this splinter group of uh, Judeans are in Egypt, and so they get this warning, and this warning tells them that it's Nebuchadnezzar is God's servant. That seems a little odd, doesn't it? A person who doesn't even worship God uh, would be used as God's servant. That means that God's plan is being carried out, and Babylon is going to Egypt. He says, I will set a throne on these stones that I have hidden. He will spread his royal canopy over them. Talking about Nebuchadnezzar. And when he comes, he will destroy the land of Egypt. He will bring death to those destined for death. Now notice how he draws this out of the seriousness of this warning. It is this. Death to those destined to die. He will bring captivity to those destined for captivity, and he will bring the sword against those who are destined for the sword. So there will be those who die, those who die through famine, those who die by the sword, and those who will be captive, held, taken into captivity. Verse 12, he will set fire, Nebuchadnezzar will set fire to the temples of Egypt's gods, burning all their idols and carrying away the people as captives. He will pick clean the land of Egypt as a shepherd picks fleas from his cloak. And I read that and I kind of chuckled thinking, you know, we're a long way from that. I don't know how that worked out, but you know good and well when those guys had to have warm coats and cloaks that had that fur on there, and I guess the fleas still embedded themselves in that. Fleas are hard to get rid of. And he himself will leave unharmed. He will break down the sacred pillars standing in the temple of the sun. And he will burn down the temples of the Egyptian gods. So, this warning just like the other warnings, but this war the first warning, don't go to Egypt. This warning is everybody's going to have problems, okay? Egyptians being going to be taken captive. Uh, people are going to die by the sword because Nebuchadnezzar is going to reign there for a period of time until he wipes everything out and he's going to destroy all the temples, everything that's been set up. And uh, so that's not good news, but all of that was because of this one thought that they had. Led by their sin, they believed that what they were doing was right. They didn't measure it by what God said was right. They measured it by what they said was right. And they concluded that God was wrong, God's prophet was wrong, his word and his message was wrong, and therefore they were going to do what they needed to do. The prophet, just think, Jeremiah, this faithful man, this faithful prophet who had been at the forefront of every measured step as the Babylonians began to take over the territory of Israel and Judah, and all along the way, this prophet, this preacher, was warning the people, encouraging the people, and he, he served for over 40 years, and not a single person listened to what he had to say. And through all of that faithful service, giving his life for them, it comes down to the fact that they simply called him a liar. A liar. Because he would not do anything but speak God's truth. But they said God's truth was a lie. They said it was fake news. God said it wasn't. They didn't listen. So trouble ensued. So let's go to chapter 44. 
And so now God is going to uh, send messages by Jeremiah over an issue of idolatry. Idolatry, we kind of think that it's only for biblical days. There is no idolatry anymore. If that's what you think, and when you hear the word idolatry, because we don't call certain things idols anymore, uh, we're wrong. We're wrong in our understanding. Idolatry still exists today. And guys, through what we're going to read, God can't stand it. And those who invest, listen to me, those who invest in idolatry are doomed. And that's what this this 44th chapter is all about. So first, in these first 14 verses, uh, Jeremiah renders a scathing indictment against this remnant. Let's, Let's read. This is the message Jeremiah received from concerning the Judeans living in northern Egypt in the cities of Megdal, Taphanes and Memphis and throughout the southern Egypt and through southern Egypt as well. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. You saw what I did to Jerusalem and to all of the towns of Judah. They now lie in ruin and no one lives in them. Because of all of their wickedness, my anger rose high against them. They burned incense, they worshipped other gods, gods that neither they nor you nor any of your ancestors have ever known. But they jumped on the popularity bandwagon. They went with the current uh, flow. I kind of think about what goes on today. So many people, one of the things that... uh, kind of has bothered me through this pandemic year as the riots broke out last summer and uh, BLM took a foothold in American society, certainly uh, with corporations, uh, with uh, city municipalities, and with people. And it seemed to be specifically uh, young white people. And what we began to see, and I saw this with my own eyes on, on, a, on a TV report this past summer, is that there was this gathering, and BLM leaders were there, and all of a sudden, we had white people bowing down on their knees and begging forgiveness for BLM and pledging their allegiance, putting their faith in, and being faithful to forever to BLM. Now, if you don't think that idolatry exists today and people worship things simply because it seems the most appropriate thing to do at the time, the issue is how does that match up to what God has said? It's really easy. If you've been in church at all, I don't care what color your skin is. If you call yourself a Christian, listen to me. God says, I will have no other gods before me. You will worship at no one else's temple. You will not put your life in the hands of another human. You put your life in my hands. This is going on today. And here we're reading these words. And these words really tell us a lot. Verse 3, once again, Because of all their wickedness, my anger rose high against them. They burned incense and worshipped other gods. Gods that neither they nor you nor any of your ancestors have ever known. Again and again, I sent my servants, the prophets, to plead with them. 
don't do these horrible things that I hate so much. But my people would not listen or turn back from their wicked ways. They kept right on burning incense to these gods. And so my fury burned over and fell like fire on the towns of Judah and into the streets of Jerusalem, and now they are desolate ruins. When we worship something besides God, And that can be everything from the possessions that we have uh, to the clothes we wear, to the friends we have. If all of those things become more important in your daily and weekly routine than being in God's presence and worshiping Him, you have an idle problem, even if it is yourself. And that's been coming out all of this time during COVID. Verse 7, And now the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, asks you, Why are you destroying yourselves? For not one of you will survive, not a man, woman, or child among you who has come here from Judah, not even the babies in your arms. Do you hear that? Do you see the seriousness of this indictment that God is placing upon the children of Israel? And they left. We've already read that every man, woman, and child that was left went to Egypt. Now God says every man, woman, and child will not leave Egypt. Verse 8. Why arouse my anger by burning incense to the idols you have made here in Egypt? You will only destroy yourselves and make yourselves an object of cursing and mockery for all the nations of the earth. And hasn't that been kind of the case uh, through the history that we can tell that the people of God, the, the Jewish people, have been targets of scorn, ridicule, hatred, bigotry, In, in, in the following generations. And why? Because they went to Egypt. Verse 9. Have you forgotten the sins of your ancestors? The sins of the kings and the queens of Judah. And the sins you and your wives committed in Judah and Jerusalem. To this very hour, you have shown no remorse, no reverence. No one has chosen to follow my law and the decrees that I gave you and your ancestors before you. So he points out once again that there is an issue with their history. Have you not noticed that going on today? There, there's this intent to destroy uh, and to change history. Uh, they're using uh, critical race theory in the 1619 project that 1776 is not the valid start of, of our republic, of our nation, and that they're revising history. That's what this country's about right now that we're not paying attention to what history really is, is that we're making new history relevant to the current time. Here, God points them back. You don't remember the sins of your ancestors when you were in Egypt as slaves. And then all the kings of Judah, as they, they built the Judean Empire, the Hebrew Empire, those sins that were committed and then through the people themselves. And they're still, what? Unremorseful, unrepentant. They live in their sin and enjoy it. No one has chosen 
to follow my law and decrees that I gave you and to your ancestors. And then verse 11, Therefore the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, I have made up my mind to destroy every one of you. And that's not what you want to hear from the sovereign God of the universe, the God of heaven's armies. Verse 12, I will take this remnant of Judah that insisted on coming here to Egypt, and I will consume them. They will fall here in Egypt, killed by war and famine. All will die. And why, are they, why is this happening? They disobeyed God and went to Egypt, and then when they settled into Egypt, they began to take on the Egyptian gods, and all of that idol worship has led them to a place where they don't need God anymore, and that is God's point for all of this destruction. Now, so the remnant's going to die. They will be an object of damnation, horror, cursing, and mockery. I will punish them in Egypt just as I punished them in Jerusalem by war, famine, and disease. Verse 14. Of those who fled to Egypt with dreams of returning home to Judah, only a handful will escape. So what is he saying? Only a handful who came only a handful will escape from those who came and fled from Jerusalem. In other words, the only thing that will remain is a remnant of the remnant. So even a smaller portion of what was already a small contingency of the people of Jerusalem will even come close to surviving. Verse 15. Verse 15 now takes on a little bit different tone. Then all the women present and all the men who knew that their wives had burned incense to idols, a great crowd of all the Judeans living in the Parthos and the southern region of Egypt answered Jeremiah, We will not listen to your messages from the Lord. We will do whatever we want. We will burn incense to the queen of heaven and sacrifice to her just as much as we like, just as we and our ancestors did before us and as our kings and princesses have always done in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For in those days we had plenty to eat and we were well off and had no troubles. But ever since we quit burning incense, Josiah brought that into play, demanding that they don't follow other gods and they get themselves right with God and follow the Jewish law, the law of Moses. But ever since we quit burning incense to the Queen of Heaven and stopped worshiping her, we have been in great trouble and have suffered the effects of war and famine. Well, anybody have an idea what this might be? The wife made me do it. We're going to read a little further, and we're going to kind of see that a little bit. Verse 19, And then the women added, do you suppose that we were worshiping the queen of heaven, pouring out drink offerings to her, and making cakes marked with her image without our husbands knowing it and helping us? Of course not. This refers back to uh, Numbers chapter 30, where Moses lines out about taking vows, uh, vows, vows to God, uh, vows that women make uh, if they are not married then make and if their father agrees with it then that vow is valid if the father disagrees then the, valid, the vow will be invalid if, if they're married and they make vows to, to whatever and the husband doesn't question it and allows it to happen 
then those vows are valid and have to be honored. And if, they, if the husband disagrees with those vows, then the vows become invalid. That's what it says in Numbers 30, and that's what we're seeing here, is that the husbands went along with it. You know, keep the peace. And, and notice as they're talking about, this has been going on for quite some time, this, this idol worship. This is the whole reason for God's wrath for God coming down on them hard, is they've not broken away from this idol worship. And what they're doing here is the same thing that you and I do today. We defend ourselves through our sin. It's through the basic concept uh, like this. If it's working, no need to fix it. And what were they saying? As long as we were worshiping the queen of heaven, sacrificing to her, we had plenty to eat, things were going along, we had no problems. As soon as we stopped doing that and we turned back to the Mosaic law, everything fell apart and we just started having problems after problems after problems. So, if... Worshiping the queen of heaven, it worked. It must be right. And that's the theology that they're using. And I think some people use that today. Why? Because we still want the easy way. Our faith is never realized until we're pressed on from every side. And you see Christians doing this all of the time. They never, never expect a heartache and they want things to always go smooth and they always complain I'll, when's it going to get easy for me when's it going to get better for me and that's saying the same thing back when I was in my sin back when I lived for myself it was a lot better than this and this goes on today all the time and so we 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 simply get ourselves worked up over things where God is working in our lives and, and testing us and going through trials and we're ready to give up and quit and throw in the towel and blame God. What have you done for me lately? So, the women here take a vow to worship the Queen of Heaven and the husbands follow in suit. In other words, the husbands never objected. <clears throat> they never said, this is not right, wife. This is against God's word and God's law. And listen, this is something that's important. We've kind of lost this today because we don't have the head of households anymore. There's very few couples that are married anymore and that people just cohabitate together and they just you know, can, can check out when they want to. But the bottom line is, is that <clears throat> we're lacking in godly men knowing godly things. And their wives take over and run things and not necessarily biblically. Now that's not to say that women don't understand the Bible, so don't take offense by that. But men, we need to lead godly lives first in order to lead our wives and our families in godly things. And this is important. It was important to God and it's important to us. We need to remember that our sins caused, us, caused God a lot of heartache, cost God His one and only Son. And we need to realize that when we come together as husbands and wives and we make decisions that affect the family, that's also our worship. That's also our worship, and shame on men who let their wives go worship and they stay at home and work on something and fiddle around all day, drinking beer and doing other things because it's Sunday and they got to rest. Shame on you, especially if you stand up and say you're a Christian and, <clears throat> and you're mighty good with just staying at the house and sending the wife and the kids to church. Stop it. Start growing in Christ and be a man of God because that's not being a man of God. Verse 20, 
Then Jeremiah said to all of them, men and the women alike, and giving them this answer, do you think the Lord did not know that your ancestors, your kings, your officials, and all the people were burning incense to idols in the towns of Judah and all the streets of Jerusalem? It was because the Lord could no longer bear all these evil things that you were doing that made your land an object of cursing, desolate ruin without a single inhabitant to this very day. This very reason, all these terrible things have happened to you because you have burned incense to idols and sinned against the Lord, refusing to obey Him to follow His instructions, laws, and stipulations. Listen, they, they, were, they were not doing the right thing, but they thought they were. They were basically saying, we're better off disobeying God and worshiping idols than to worship God and follow the law of Moses. That's what's going on here. Verse 24, Jeremiah then says to all of them, including the women, listen to this message from the Lord, all the citizens of Judah who are in Egypt. The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, You and your wives have said that you will never give up your devotion and sacrifices to the Queen of he Heaven. Now, by the way, the Queen of Heaven, this Egyptian god, excuse me, was a goddess of fertility. Okay? And you have proven it by your actions. So go ahead and carry out your promises and vows to her. Okay, have at it. Verse 26, but listen, while you're involved with all that, but listen to this message from the Lord, all of you Judeans now living in Egypt. I've sworn by my great name, full stop. God is swearing by his name. <clears throat> God's swearing by his name. You know, many times you've seen, uh, like Perry Mason, and before somebody takes the witness stand, uh, they're asked to pledge that everything they say will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and they put their hand on the Bible, raise their right hand, and say, so help me God. They are taking an oath. They are swearing by God who is truth, that's what that stems back to, that they will be telling the truth. So help me God. God swears by his own name. Think how important this is. <clears throat> that my name will no longer, look at this, my name will no longer be spoken by any of the Judeans in the land of Egypt. None of you may invoke my name or use this oath. In other words, <clears throat> don't be praying to me. Don't be coming to me. You're barking up the wrong tree. As assuredly as the sovereign Lord lives, don't be doing that anymore. Don't call on my name. For I will watch over you and bring disaster, not good. You will suffer war and famine until all of you are dead. Now, you realize God's really fed up. He's fed up with their dealings. That it's more important to have our needs satisfied than it is to follow a holy and righteous God who loved them with an everlasting love, by the way. All right. Verse 28. Only a small number will escape. There's that remnant of the remnant. Okay, Only a small number will escape death and return to Judah from Egypt. Then all of those who came to Egypt will find out whose words are true, mine or theirs. Now God says it's going to be put up or shut up. It kind of reminds me, remember Elijah? And he went before the prophets of Baal, and 
before Queen Jezebel and, and built that altar, and they built an altar, and God said, or, or Elijah was saying that, okay, we're going to find out who's God's real. Who's God's going to come to our aid? And here God's saying this of himself. We're going to find out if, if the queen of Egypt is the one to listen to, or should you be taking my word? Okay? And they still think they have an ace in the hole. Let's read a little further. Verse 29. And this is the proof I will give you, says the Lord, that all I have threatened will happen to you, and that I will punish you here. I will... I will turn Pharaoh, Horpha, king of Egypt, over to his enemies who want to kill him. Just as I turned King Zedekiah of Judah over to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, I, the Lord, have spoken. So what happened to Zedekiah that Jeremiah prophesied about is going to happen to Pharaoh. And this happened by the hands of his own people. He wasn't liked very much, and we know that he didn't have much of a backbone because when he came down to rescue, uh, when Zedekiah sent word for him to come and help, help them fight against the Babylonians, as he started marching that way and then saw the, the vastness of the Babylonian army, he turned around and went back to Egypt. And so he was, he was taken out. He was destroyed. So, here's what we know. We know that there will be just a few who will escape but go back to captivity to Babylon, return back through to Judah to Jerusalem, which is barren and nobody's there. But the majority of all of those people will die and no prayers will be answered. You can't use God's name. And then... It moves and shifts. We're fixing to make a transition, and next week we will start with uh, chapter 46, which starts uh, looking at messages that are sent to all these different nations and God's judgment upon them. But first, I want to look at and talk about this servant mentality that Jeremiah's secretary had. Chapter 45, the prophet Jeremiah gave this message to Barak, son of Neriah, in the fourth year of the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, after Barak had written down everything Jeremiah had dictated to him. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to you, Barak, you have said, so, Barak has been complaining, has been feeling like the odds are against them, and so it has overwhelmed him, and that's what it says here. I'm overwhelmed with trouble. Haven't I had enough pain already? And now the Lord has added more. I am weary of my own sighing, and can find no rest. This is a person who is not knowing where to turn or what to do. He, first of all, is responsible for these writings that we're reading right now today in 2021. He took dictation from Jeremiah all these days. He, he partnered himself with Jeremiah, against a lot of odds, because Jeremiah's what? Been put in prison, uh, he's been beat, he's, he's, he's kind of like Paul in that way, he's suffered greatly for the cause of the Lord Almighty. And Brock has followed him instead of following all the things that the people have been involved in. He hasn't been involved in idol worship. He hasn't done any of those things, but at the same time as he looks around him, so he's still operating by sight, and not by faith. And so God hears this. And this is what's important for you and for me. There are times when, when we're really perplexed. Why isn't God answering my prayer? I've been working for the Lord. I've been giving Him my life. 
and I've been doing everything he's asked me to do, and I was following his words, but every time I turn and look around, everything is so hopeless. Everything is just turning to nothing. What's the use? And that's where we find him. And sometimes you can get that way in your mind, and, and, and you don't express it maybe outwardly, but inside you hold so many things down and, and it begins to destroy you from the inside out. It destroys your faith. It destroys your hope. It destroys your peace. And this is what's going on with this faithful secretary of this faithful prophet, Barak. I'm overwhelmed. Let me read it again. I'm overwhelmed with trouble. Any of you ever thought those thoughts? Haven't I? had enough pain already and now the Lord has added more I'm weary of my own sighing he's tired of crying he's tired of weeping he's tired of being sad and he can't find any rest you know when you worry all the time you can't sleep it's just a constant over and over again, running it through your minds. And here, he is so weary about his own condition that he has no peace, that he has no rest. Well, God has something to say to him. Look at verse 4. Brock, this is what the Lord says. And, 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 and look at this. As we've seen before, this whole dialogue, the women of, of Judah are saying that, you know, we worship this God. We've had good success in worshiping the queen of heaven. We've, we've been prosperous when we do that. We're going back to doing that because doing anything with God was, was not profitable. And he's hearing, he's seeing this. He, he's resisting it. But what he's seeing, he's going, are they right? Could that actually be what we need to do? God comes in and he says this, to reassure. It doesn't look like he's reassuring, but he's reassuring Barak for what he's done, written down all of these prophecies that the, that the Lord God has given Jeremiah. He's dicta all that dictation he's written down. The Lord says, I will destroy this nation that I built. I will uproot what I plan. So before all of those messages, now listen to me, follow me here. This man is what we would call in present day a layman. Okay, He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't even a part. He wasn't a part of the Levitical order. He was simply someone who came alongside, just like uh, Moses had Aaron. And... Paul had Timothy and Titus and Jude. And David had his mighty men of valor. There have always been those who are the supporting cast, the ones who help the preacher get things done. Brock was one of those. And all of this time, God speaking to Jeremiah to the people and what they need to hear. This time, the word comes to Barak. This time, the word comes directly to him. He needed a message. He needed to hear from God himself. And this is what it is. I'm going to destroy this nation that I built. He's already written about that. He knows what God's word is. This is a reaffirmation that what you wrote was not in vain. It was the truth. I will uproot what I planted. Are you seeking great things for yourself now? Here's, here's a personal life check, a spiritual checkup, if you will. God asked him a real important question. Are you seeking great things for yourself? Are you trying to get something out of this? Don't do it. But don't be discouraged either. Don't be discouraged. You get discouraged when you think, okay, there's nothing in it for me. And that's what today's pseudo-Christianity is about, this, this, 
new way of looking at what God does, that He's supposed to do something for me, and my self-esteem is supposed to be elevated, and my life is supposed to be elevated, and I should get something out of this for my faithfulness. You know what you get out of it? Don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Why? When you're overwhelmed with trouble. Let's go back and let's, let's connect this. Let's connect this for you tonight, okay, before we leave. Time's almost out. Don't be discouraged, God says. If this message was for him, someone who is serving the Lord, someone who is in the laity, then look at this. For all the hard work, sometimes you get discouraged. I think many of you, including me, get discouraged at what we see at Olive Place when there are no young people coming in. There's no children here. That everyone here seems to be sick and afflicted. And there's something creeping in that causes you to be discouraged. Why? Because it's all overwhelming, the trouble that we have. Haven't I had enough pain? Hasn't the church been through enough pain in all of these decades? And now the Lord has even added more? I'm weary? I'm tired? I have no rest? God says, are you doing it for yourself or are you doing it for me? You've got to ask yourself that question, believer. Are you living your Christian life for the Lord, or are you living your Christian life for you, what you can get out of it? Pats on the back because, you know, you, you whitewash the walls, or you mowed the grass, or you uh, cleaned the carpet, or you sang a song, or you played an instrument, or you took up the offering, or you did some other, taught a Sunday school class, just so you could have somebody say, you're doing a great job. Wow, what could we do without you? You're doing it for yourself. But with all of that said, God's word is this to you. This is reassurance of a promise. And let's look at this. Don't be discouraged. I will bring great disaster upon all of those people, but I will protect you wherever you you go. I, the Lord, have spoken. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that's a word of encouragement to you tonight. I try really hard to, to leave it that way because that's how it's gone through the whole book of Jeremiah. There have been all of these cursings. There have been all of these, thus saith the Lord. There's been, I'm going to bring destruction, death, famine, all of these things over and over and over again, and we get tired of listening to it. We, our minds get numb over it, and it just keeps coming and coming and coming. But that's kind of the reality of our life. Life keeps coming and coming, and how do we respond to it? We need to trust God more than we trust ourselves. Don't be discouraged, Barack. All of these things that you d took down in dictation that you know that I've said and it doesn't look like they're happening, they will happen. So that gives him some encouragement to know that he hasn't been on the wrong team, that he's on the right team, but that his motives have to be pure and they have to be towards servanthood, faithful servanthood, and not for self-serving. Okay? And as he closes out, it's very, very reminiscent what God's saying here reflects greatly as he says this to Barak of what Matthew 6.33 says. So you've heard me probably say it many times. I know I've said it hundreds of times since I've been here at Olive Place. But it's a verse that rings so true and so true to the life of Barak and to any faithful servant, including Jeremiah, which happened to be the only two. Think about this. That, that Egypt isn't much different than Sodom and Gomorrah. There was no one righteous, okay? No one righteous in that land. Moses couldn't find anyone who was righteous. Uh, Abraham. No, but Abraham couldn't find anyone righteous there. God said, you find some, okay, I won't destroy it. But there were two that were righteous there. They definitely going to make it out of there. They're going to live. 
but all of that will be destroyed. God will destroy, okay, sin. He will take sin out. Matthew 6, 33. See, I'll do the King James Version. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Do not seek ye first you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Okay? Righteousness comes through worship, comes through the Word. And all these things will be added unto you. It's going to work out, Barak. Trust me. You've sought the kingdom first. It's going to come for you. The other part of this that I see about servanthood and being a lay person is you need to have the attitude of John the Baptist in John chapter 3 and verse 30. You remember what John said when, when it was he noted talking about the Messiah? He said that the Messiah must increase, I must decrease. That's how you serve. I've been at this church a long time and I see people, I've seen people through all these 30 years come in here, they want to serve, but they want to serve to be noticed. They want to serve to have some trophy given to them because of their service. And they're puffed up and they're proud. And when they don't get what they want, they leave. They disappear. Listen, it's important to realize that service is thankless most of the time. Being a lay person is, is the, the faithfulness coming out of you to do what God wants you to do. And many times it won't be in the limelight. It won't be up on stage. It, it will be behind the curtain, so to speak. It will be in the background. But if you hold true to who you are and recognize that the Lord must increase in my life, and I must decrease my pride, myself. God will reward that. Trust me in that. It's a truth that you can live by that will give you peace. It will give you hope. Brock, don't put your hope in Judah. It's not going to last. Can I say something now a little political? Christians because I know some of you are really upset over the things that are going on in our country today, I'll join with you. And I do that because of my Christian worldview is why they're upsetting to me. But I'm telling you, God is no respecter of person or nation. Nations have come and nations have fallen. And God has caused His own nation the one that he loved more than any, Judah, to fall. Why? Because of idolatry. Because they were going with what they saw and not what faith was teaching them. It can happen here in America, and I think we're seeing the dismantling of it now. But that should not cause you to waver. Don't put your trust in the United States. Even on our own money, what does it tell you? What's the slo one of the slogans of our country that's on our money, the guarantee of who we are? In God we trust. I don't trust Republicans. I don't trust progressive. I don't trust socialists. I don't trust them. Don't put your trust in Judah, in a nation. Put your trust in in God and Him alone. Well, I hope that wasn't too hard. Probably if it was, you've already, you know, checked out. And that's okay. Because we serve a God of grace. And He uh, is giving us days of grace until He sends His Son Jesus to rescue us. Until that time, let's be faithful servants. Let's be faithful servants. That's our takeaway tonight. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the people of Olive Place, and I thank you for their faithfulness. 
We are served by so many, God, who, who no one knows all of the work and all of the effort that they do behind the scenes. Lord, continue to bless their lives because they're seeking the kingdom of God first. And Father, may we be able to disciple others by our actions and by what we do so that, they would, so that when they become discouraged, they could receive a word of encouragement for you. That don't put your trust in men or things, but put your trust in God. May we put our trust in you, O Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good night, everybody, and I'll see you Sunday. Pray that uh, you uh, avoid high water and don't get too soaked because we've got more rain coming our way, I believe. But just remain faithful. Even when you're troubled, discouraged, please remain faithful. God will reward you. Matthew 6.33. Good night. Not too many.